Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. Today is our anniversary, so after this video, we're going out to dinner. When I was uh, first starting out, one of the books I bought was The Bright Side of Chess by Irving Chernev, and it had some really, really interesting games in it, and this was one of my favorites. And I thought the best way to watch this game is we're going to show the game twice, and what I want you to do while I'm showing it the first time is try to figure out the evaluation of the position. In other words, who stands better, how much better, and why. And so you're looking for things like white's a little better, black's a little better, black's a lot better, white's winning, white's going to win easily, you know, that kind of stuff. You don't have to guess it in computer numbers if you don't want to. You know, you don't have to say white's up 1.7 pawns. But I'm going to show you the game. This was played in 1844. Um, again, it's from the, it was played in Paris. And again, it's from the book, The Bright Side of Chess, but of course, it's a game that uh, anybody can get if they look up the game. All right, so here we go. See if you can figure out who's winning as we go through the game. We're going to go through it twice. The first time we're going to go through with just the moves slowly, you can try to guess who's winning. The second time we go through it, we'll turn the engine on and you can see what the answer was. All right, so white opened up E4. Black played e5, and white played f4. This was the romantic era of chess, and this is the famous king's gambit. Today, the computers don't like f4 very much, but uh, when you're evaluating the position, you can take that into account. All right, so black plays e takes f4. White plays the main move, knight f3. Black holds on to his pawn with g5. White develops his king side with bishop c4, and black attacks the knight. All right, well, there are some lines where you leave the knight here on f3 and you just let him take it off, but this isn't one of them. So white plays knight to e5 with a double attack against f7 and against g4. Black says, all right, I'm going to ignore that for the moment and check you. And white says, I'll play king f1. I know I can't castle, but right now I've got those two nice pieces in the center. <clears throat> Black plays f3, trying to breach the white king position. White says, I'll just grab a big center. You can play your f3 move. And now it's black's turn. Again, we'll pause a little bit. Anytime you want to evaluate and you want to stop, you don't need me to pause for you. All you have to do is hit the pause button, see if you can evaluate the position. If you want, you could scribble it down. You could scribble down right now. After 7d4, I think the evaluation is umpty ump, whatever you want to write, as I said. You could do it in computer notation, minus 1.2. You can say black's a little better. You can say black's winning, whatever you want to say. All right, so black develops his knight. Knight f6 hits the pawn on e4. He's ignoring the attack on this f7 pawn. White says, I'll guard my pawn on e4. Black says, let me get ready to possibly castle with bishop to g7. And white says, I'm going to attack the queen with g3. Notice the queen doesn't have a lot of great squares to go to right here. If he plays queen to h5, then bishop takes f7 check, would win the queen for two pieces. So, of course, black plays queen h3 check. White plays king to f2. Black plays d6. He says, go away, Mr. Knight. What's the knight going to do? Knight says, all right, fine. If you're going to force me, I'll take that pawn on f7. And black says, let me threaten to win two pieces for a rook with rook f8. If black can just play rook takes f7, bishop takes f7, king takes f7, that would be a really big advantage for black. White says, nope, I'm going to save my knight and attack the queen. Black says, all right, I'll chase the, the king around. Queen to g2 check. And now white cannot play king to e1, of course, because if queen takes h1 check resigns. He has to let the queen continue to guard the rook, so it's forced to play king to e3. And now black plays bishop to h6, pinning the knight to the king and threatening to take the knight with check, so white needs to save the knight. So white moves the king yet again, king to d3, allowing the bishop on c1 to guard the knight on g5. If I remember correctly, when, when I read about this game a little bit, I think this was all book, believe it or not. This was a, a book, 
you know, crazy opening. All right, so black plays knight c6. Well, if you're playing hope chess and you're not looking for his checks, captures, and threats, and you do some idle move here, black's going to play knight to b4 check, and when you move your king back into the e3 square, he'll play bishop takes g5 checkmate. So black's actually threatening checkmate in two here with knight to c6. So it's white's turn, and white plays a3, simply stopping that checkmate with knight b4 check. All right, if, it's, if you're black here, what would you do for black? You need to finish your development. Are you going to get your queen bishop out and then try to castle queen side? Black plays, bishop takes, g5. Now, why is he doing that? Looks like he's just helping white develop. White plays, bishop takes, g5. Again, what would you do for black here? How do you take advantage of maybe that king on d3? Who's better? Is it better to be white? with his nice center, or is it better to be black with that king on d3? Black plays knight takes e4, sacrificing the knight to expose the king. All right, again, if you want to, you can pause the video and tell me who you think's better. Knight takes a little bit of analysis here. Should white play king takes? Should he play knight takes? Should he play, maybe pin that knight to the king? What should he do? He plays queen to e1. Doesn't take the knight, but just simply pins it to the king. Black says, all right, I'll do a counter thread. You've got my knight pinned. I'll guard it, but now when I move my king, let's say I castle queen side or move my king to d7, then I'll be threatening to move my knight with discovered attacks, which would almost lead to mate. White says, okay, let me get rid of that knight. And black says, I'll attack the queen that's going to give a discovered check. Now here white could get a double check with knight f6 or knight d6, and then black can't take the queen on d1 because he's in double check. So white has the possibility to play double check here. Is that possible? And the answer is no, of course not. That knight's pinned to the king. So black's not worried about those double checks. So let's go back. We'll play that move again. So double checks would be great, unfortunately illegal. All right, so it's white's turn. Well, he can't let black take off the queen with the pawn, can he? Well, maybe he can, but he doesn't. He plays queen to e3. All right, now white would love to get the king out of the pin so he can move the knight. Black would love to keep the pressure on that knight. Right now he's got a bishop on it and a queen on it, but white's guarding it with a queen and a king. So what does black do here? He plays king to d7. Since he can't castle through check, he moves the king out of the way so he can bring the rook over and put more pressure on that knight. So now what should white do about that? He's got a problem that black can really build up the pressure. All right, so white plays bishop d5, overprotecting the knight so that when it gets attacked, he has an extra guard on that knight with the bishop. Black's turn, you could probably guess Black's move here. Of course, he takes the last rook into play, and he plays rook on a to e8. I might mention that Kizaritsky is a very famous player. Kizaritsky played Anderson in a famous game. Anderson had two famous games, the Immortal game and the Evergreen Park T. I believe the Immortal game was played against Kizaritsky, and the Evergreen Park T was played against Dufresne. No, not the guy from Shawshank Redemption. That was 100 years before that. But, uh, yeah, Evergreen Part T. If you haven't ever seen these games, Evergreen Part T and the Immortal Game, well, maybe we'll do it on the video series sometime. But for now, I'm, I thought I'd show some games that are a little less known. And this is certainly one. And we've got a lot of excitement here after Rook on A to E8. That poor knight that's pinned to the king is in trouble. But, of course, black's down a piece. But he has that wonderful pawn on f2. Right now it looks like both kings are a little shaky. The white king on d3 and the black king on d7. So who would you rather have here? Would you rather be black? Would you rather be white? Which side is winning? So white plays rook on a to f1. Blocking the pawn and also kind of blocking in the queen a little bit here on g2. So the queen can't easily get back in the game. Black now plays bishop takes check. And of course, we're going to expect that white's going to take with the bishop. And he does. 
And now you'd say, well, but the bishop's guarded twice, and it's attacked twice. So if black starts taking that bishop, white will win the exchange, a rook for a bishop. Instead, black plays the cute move, rook f3, sort of a sneaky pin. Because if the queen takes, then black can take with the pawn, winning a queen for a rook. But if the bishop takes the rook, then rook takes e3 check, gets the queen for the rook, and then he takes the bishop. And either way, black's going to win the queen. And right now, the queen is pinned to the king, so that white can't really do much else. So white's going to be losing his queen here. End of game, you say? Well, maybe not. Things are still a little interesting. So white decides to take with the queen. And now, of course, uh, black can't take with the queen because he'll lose the queen back after bishop takes. So he takes with the pawn, and now black has a queen and a rook and a knight against two rooks and two bishops. If we count the material up, it's pretty close. I mean, a queen is roughly worth a rook and a bishop and a pawn, but white also has the bishop pair. So white's got a fair amount of material for the, for the queen here. But the queen's a little bit awkward here on this g2 square. But on the other hand, these rooks can't move. So who do you like better here? Do you think now, now that black has won white's queen that he's completely winning? All right, let's see what white did. White plays bishop check. Well, already, you, if you didn't evaluate without looking at his checks, captures, and threats, you're missing a big deal here because there's only one legal move now for black. He has to put the rook in the way. And now if you're a beginner and you jump on taking the rook here, that would be a big, 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 big mistake. Because when you have a piece pinned, yes, you could take it at any time, but the best thing to do is to keep the pressure up on the, on the pinned piece. And white, of course, is a very strong master. So he doesn't take the rook. He plays d5, increasing the pressure on e6 with the idea of not just winning a rook for a bishop, but winning a rook for nothing. All right, so it's black's turn, and black plays knight e5 check. White moves his king over to e4, and now uh, if black plays a discovered check, white will simply meet that with capturing the rook with check. So instead, black plays h5. Why is he doing that? Well, he's doing that because the combination of his knight and the queen, maybe if the pawn pushes, at some point the queen will be able to come out and create problems for the white king. So he's, he's waiting to see what happens with his bishop on g5, whether he can get away with pushing the pawn to h4. M meanwhile, white would like to, to do something. He could win the rook right away on e6, but then he has to figure out what to do after that. So you could probably analyze this position and figure out what you want to play with white. Are you going to play d takes e6 check? Are you going to play bishop takes e6 check? Are you going to do neither because he can't run away? After all, we just said if you have something pinned, there's no rush to take it off usually unless he's threatening to stop you. All right, so white does take the rook with the pawn check. Now white has two rooks and two bishops for a queen and a knight, which is a pretty nice advantage in material. But black still has that pawn on the seventh rank, and those rooks are kind of frozen. So black plays king to e8. He can't let that pawn go in and get a queen. So he plays king to e8, and now, of course, white can't play bishop check because the knight will just take the bishop. So here, white plays bishop f6. And one of his ideas are that in some lines, he's going to take off that knight, and then with the queen trapped, with the bishop holding the square and getting the queen trapped, he'll be able to zugzwang the black king and try to push this pawn in and get a queen. What can black do about that idea? Who do you like better now? Do you like the guy with the extra queen, or do you like the guy with the bishop pair? Black plays h4 and says, go ahead and take my pawn with the bishop, but then you can't take my knight, and that'll give me time to do some other things and recover. White says, uh, I'll let you take that. I'll let you have that pawn. I'll take there. And black, of course, recaptures, and white takes there. Now the question is, what would white do if black just plays king e7 here? And I think the answer to some extent is, well, he could push this pawn down the board, although that lets the queen get back in the game, or he could try to trap the queen in there on g2 and, and win up a bishop. So let's see what black does. Black says, I'm not going to let you trap my queen. I'm going to take that pawn, 
And if you take back, then I will be able to get back with queen takes g3 check. So what should white do then? If h takes g, queen takes g3 check, then he could start chasing the king around. All right, white plays h3 and says, let me keep your queen a prisoner in here. And now black gets an idea. Well, before we get that idea, maybe you should evaluate the position. And black says, I'll just take a rook. Why is he doing that? Because rooks connected past pawns on the sixth rank beat a rook, even with the bishop helping. And now if the rook takes, they'll be connected past pawns on the seventh rank. So what should white do after queen takes rook? Looks like he should take that queen off, right? Even though he gets pawns in the seventh. White says, no, you can take all my rooks and get all the queens you want. I'll just move my king up to f6. Why did he do that? Well, he did that because he wants to play bishop g6 check. And then he can check with the pawn and all of a sudden black's in some trouble there. Black says, all right, let me take another rook. White says, all right, I'm down a queen and all those connected past pawns, but I have one past pawn too. Black moves out of check. White checks. Black plays king d7. White queens with check. Black plays king d6. And white plays queen e6 check. And black resigns because if he plays king to c5, he gets mated in a few moves. And we'll turn on the engine and we'll show you. All right, let's make the board a little smaller here. Mate in four, b4 check, king to b5, bishop e8 check, c6, queen to e5 check, king to b6, queen to a5 checkmate. He could have gone to a6 or a4, but it's still queen a5 would be checkmate in all those moves too. All right, let's go through the game the same way and see who was winning all the way. Do you think the same person was winning the whole game or do you think things switched around? We'll find out in a little bit. All right, e4, e5, f4, Stockfish says, ooh, I don't like the king's gambit. Minus 0.8, black's better. Black's better if he takes the pawn. White plays there, Stockfish says, I would guard the pawn, just like Kizaritsky did 180 years ago. Kizaritsky says, yeah, I've been studying with my stockfish, and he tells me to play that move. White plays bishop c4. Stockfish says, Mr. Kizaritsky, why don't you play g4 and hit the knight? And he does, and now Stockfish says, well, black's better, but white should play the gambit and play castles and give up that knight. That's his best chance. White says, well, that's not the line I studied. I like the knight e5 line. And Kizaritsky says, yes, yeah, Stockfish told me to check. King f1. And now black's up by about two pawns already with this opening. So if you like this opening for black instead of white because white can't castle, well, it's not just the white can't castle. It's that uh, he's not really going to be able to get his pieces out as well as he would like, given the fact that his king is already awkward. So black plays f3, and the engine says... No, 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 just offer the trade of knights with knight c6. And if he takes this pawn with his knight to trap the rook, just bring your bishop here and threaten checkmate. If he tries to stop the checkmate by trading queens, push this pawn. And if he tries to block things off with h3, just play knight f6. If he takes the rook, you can play bishop f2 hitting that queen. And when he tries to save the queen, you can keep attacking it. And Stockfish says black's up by seven pawns here. Six points, uh, seven pawns. All right, so back to the game. So black played f3. White played d4. Black plays knight f6. Now black's lead is down to about 0. 0.9. Knight c3. Bishop g7. Now black's lead is all the way down to about two-thirds of a pawn. G3, Stockfish doesn't like that move. Says, I would give him a little check with the bishop and then move the bishop back. G3, as I said, this is probably a book line, I think. Queen H3, check. King F2, Stockfish said King E1 was a little better. D6, not the best move. Stockfish says, the right idea is to check. And when the king goes here, just play Knight C6. And black's up by 4.6. 
But I think, as I said, they're following a book line, d6. Knight takes f7. Again, queen g2 check right away. Rook f8. Stockfish says, stop that queen check with bishop f1, and white's only down by two pawns. White plays there and forces the queen to check him. King e3, and now instead of bishop h6, the engine says, play knight to c6, minus 6 for black. So if you didn't like this opening for white and you said, I would never do this for white, I think black's like winning, you're actually right. Okay, bishop h6 threatening the mate. That's not the best move. Black's lead goes from minus 6 all the way down to minus 1.3. King to d3, knight c6, best move, a3, best move. Black's still much better here. Bishop takes there, that's not the best move. Engine says, oh, I like knight a5, not the most obvious move. So bishop takes g5, bishop takes g5, knight takes e4. Stockfish says, oh, you didn't need to sack that knight. Just play knight a5 with a nice advantage of about half a pawn. After knight takes e4, it says, now white's completely winning. That sacrifice is terrible. Now it go, goes to plus 4. So we had a position before where black could have been minus 6. And now he white is plus 4.7. So if you said, oh, that was a terrible sacrifice, you're right, but not for obvious reasons. So queen e1 engine goes, don't do that. Just play knight takes. And if he plays bishop f5, just move your king out of the way. And if he takes your knight off, hit the queen. And now if the queen tries to save himself with something like queen h3, now pin the bishop and you're up seven pawns. Not obvious at all. All right, back to the game. So white pins the knight, and the engine goes from white's better by 4.3 to after that move, white's now down by two pawns. So we, that's a six-pawn mistake. So if you're watching one of those thermometers on Chess24 or Chess.com giving the evaluation of the game, it just would have gone from white's way ahead to black's winning. So black plays bishop f5, and the engine goes, no, no, no. Hit the, push the pawn first, even if he can take the knight. So bishop f5, it says now white should take that knight, and the game's about even. So after knight takes e4, if you said, well, the game's about even, maybe black's a little better. In fact, black's a lot better, but he's not winning anymore. Then you would be right, but it's hard to believe in a game like this where it's going back and forth like crazy that we would actually get to a point where it's close to even chances. So black now plays f2, and now that his eight-tenths of a pawn advantage has disappeared, and now it's 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. Queen to e3, it says black should play bishop to g6, 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. Black moves the king, it's still 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. And now white should block this pawn with the, this rook. In the game, if you remember, white decided to block it with the other rook. Is that just as good? It's 0, 0, 0 with that rook. Is it, what is it with that rook? Oh, sorry, bishop there first, bishop d5, still 0, 0, 0. The rook pins, and now which rook should do it? Rook there is 0, 0, 0. He uses the other rook. Oops! Jumps from 0, 0, 0 to minus 4. The wrong rook. Oh my goodness, he should have put the other rook in there. And then he would have his equal position. Crazy position. Black says, I can win the queen. And the computer goes, go ahead and win my queen. I don't care. Bishop takes rook f3, best move. And now the engine says, I'm going to play the obvious king to d2. And I'll be up five pawns if you take my queen. White plays queen takes there. And guess what? His lead goes down after king d2. He had a five pawn lead. And now his lead jumps all the way down to three pawns if black plays his best move, knight b4 check, which I don't think hardly anybody would play. It doesn't make any sense. But engines find crazy things that humans don't find immediate sense with. So black takes with the pawn, and the engine goes, well, now white's going to win that rook. He's up by four pawns. d5, knight e5 check. It says white should play king c3. White plays king e4. Star engine goes, well, that's good too. And black plays h5. White plays his best move. He takes the rook with the pawn. And now it says, I don't care that black has an extra queen. White's up nine pawns. So black goes back. And now should white allow black to push that pawn? Or should he go after this bishop trade for the knight? 
He goes after the bishop trade, and the engine says, you're right on, Mr. Michalitsky. That's the Michelet. I shouldn't call him Mich Michalitsky. He's Kitz Kizaritsky, but it's not Michalitsky. It's Michelet. Michelet, you're right on, Mr. Michelet. You're killing him now with bishop f6. h4, should you take the pawn or should you take the knight? You take the knight. He has nothing better than take back. Now he says plus 16. Now it says you should take the pawn. You do. If black plays king e7 and blocks that pawn, the engine says white can play rook d1 and threaten mate with rook d7. The queen is out. If queen takes rook, rook checks, king e8. And now you don't even have to play bishop checks. You can play king f6 threatening bishop checks and then mate. And it's going to be mate in three. All right, so back to the game. So black did not move his king up. He took the pawn. And now the engine says the best move is the bishop check. White plays h3, blocking in the queen. We can see that's not necessary, but it is winning. It was mate in nine with bishop checks. After h3, it's uh, still mate in nine. So black plays there, which is actually his best move. It says white should take the queen. White plays king up. Oh no, it was mate in like seven. Now it's only mate in 16 or 15. Black takes the rook. Now it's down to mate in eight. Bishop checks, king over, pawn checks. I think everybody understands that white's winning now. Queen checks, king up, queen checks, best move. And we just showed the mate in four at the start, at the start of the game, well, the start of the replay of the game. So white was winning. Where was the point that that black threw it away and the answer was that here after bishop takes white's winning so bishop takes here the right move is to play bishop to g6 maybe threatening rook h3 and some lines and now black's winning so in this position Black is ahead by about five pawns if he plays bishop g6. After bishop takes e4, bishop takes e4. Even winning the queen couldn't save him. White's winning here. Queen takes, pawn takes, bishop checks. And from now on, white was winning. So that's the famous game, Michelet Kizaritsky, 1844. A really exciting game that went back and forth, back and forth. Hard to tell who was winning. I remember when I first played over this game, I'm like, Really? Did White pull this out? Was he really like winning all the way? Or what was going on here? And of course, I didn't have engines to help me out. And even the humans would have trouble with games this complicated. But it was a really fun game. And that's what I wanted, why I wanted to show it for you. Again, it was from the book, The Bright Side of Chess by Irving Cherneff. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Please tell your friends about the channel. We're going for 5,000 for five, uh, 5, subscribers. We have... Um, 4,933 last I checked. I need 67 more. Please get your friends to subscribe. If you like the video, give it a like. If you haven't subscribed yourself, of course, you can do that. But in any case, tell your friends about the channel and we'll see you next time. Bye.